Since uh, Benjamin Libet's first carried out this study in 1983, the result has been very, very controversial and it has been critiqued from many angles. One way it has been critiqued is, is it really an exercise of free will? When people make spontaneous movements in response to a clock hand, perhaps they are not exercising free will, perhaps they are responding to the clock or some other aspect of the study. If we think about the Libet task in detail, it's actually a rather complicated agreement between the subject and the experimenter about what they're going to do. So in that sense, it may not be quite as free a choice as we think it is. Lift your finger whenever you have the urge to do so. These were his exact instructions. Um, but there are all sorts of implicit indications in these instructions that I think you ought to think about. So, for example, the most obvious thing is at the end of half an hour, the subject could say, I never had the urge to move my finger, but he would know perfectly well that Libet would be rather cross about this. So that there's already a, an implicit instruction here, lift your finger several times. And if you deconstruct it even further, the instruction has to be something like, lift your finger several times during the course of this period in such a way that I can't predict when you're going to do it. Which now becomes rather a complicated um, instruction and it's really no longer so free in the sense, I mean, paradoxically, you're being told to behave as if you were a free agent by producing something unpredictable. Another criticism is that people rely on memory. They report the time on the special clock of their conscious in urge to move after the trial has ended, so after the event. As a result, they're relying on memory and much psychological research has shown how flawed and unreliable memory is. Humans tend to reconstruct the past. As a result, any experiment that relies on memory is prone to the flaws of memory. The issue that we come to um, is not one that's immediately empirically resolvable, and it's to do with what is it to take a decision and what is the connection between taking a decision and knowing that or being aware that we've taken a decision? So one thing you could say is, well, maybe the, the conscious experience of decision-making does not reflect free will, but maybe the, there's, nothing, there's no reason to say, to conclude that the unconscious process of decision might not still involve free will. The problem with that idea is that Traditionally, we think that we can only be held responsible for decisions that we were made consciously and deliberately. So if decisions that are made unconsciously don't sound quite right in terms of allocating responsibility. But I think we have to start more from a conceptual analysis than from um, this simple idea that if I am not um, if an action starts uh, at an unconscious level, then it's not our action. I don't think that's a valid argument. So I think that's what we need to better understand. And then once we understand this as a conceptual level, we can see how neuroscience or cognitive psychology might support uh, these ideas. So I think the intuition that decisions have got to be conscious can be unpacked in terms of an intuition that decisions have got eventually to lead to awareness of the decision and what's that as decided upon. But this can be via the production of an effect that arises after a slight time lag. That means that the Libet experiments prove nothing about the freedom of the will, in my view. All they might show, for all we know, is there might be a time lag between taking a decision as an action determining event and our becoming aware of it. Well, that's, that's fine and dandy, but uh, I don't think we should stay awake at night sweating about this one. But despite Libet, despite determinism, you still believe yourself that we do exercise free will? Yes, free will. I think we do, and we have this strong intuition that we do. And uh, I think that the aim of uh, a good philosophical analysis is to account for it. I mean, I, I, I kind of believe that our intuitions are quite deep. And uh, what we need is not to demonstrate that they are false, but rather to provide 
the apparatus, the philosophical tools to uh, elaborate them. Just let me say something more about why I think we do experience freedom. Um, we can experience its loss. I might lose my temper with a colleague over the phone who's not getting his job done. I might well report that I could feel myself losing it. Now, uh, what is this feeling that you're losing it? It is to feel something outside your own will, like a fit of anger, increasingly determining what you're doing. And as you feel um, uh, your action being determined by something outside your own will, so, I put it to you, you will feel your action no longer being determined by yourself. I think it's very hardwired this experience of free will, it's rather like the visual illusions that however much you know, if you know the Muller-Lyer illusion, which is where they have two lines which are the same lengths but they look different lengths, however much you know they're the same length, you can't see them as the same length and I think that would apply to one's feeling of free will, it would still be there. But there is one slightly disquieting experiment that I've heard of, which is where which obviously has to be replicated, where American students, I mean, half of them were told free will doesn't exist, everything is predetermined, and the other half were told free will does exist and there's you know, good sounding evidence for it. They then gave them some test. And the people who did, were told, had been told that there was no such thing as free will tended to cheat more. If you start um, corroding people's sense of their moral responsibility, you're going unsurprisingly to corrode their sense of right and wrong, of obligation and prohibition, morally speaking. If you start running cheap lines in the public media uh, about how we aren't really morally responsible, you could have some rather unpleasant effects. That wouldn't surprise me. So maybe these kind, this kind of knowledge could have effects on social cohesion and things like this. I really don't think that there's going to be some experiment coming out of a psychological lab that's suddenly going to change the British legal system. But I think you can get ill or not so ill-founded sceptical thoughts um, clouding the way or um, warping the way of people reason uh, about um, institution of legal responsibility. I think free will, uh, the bottom line is that we do not know the answer to this question. I think the importance of Libet's work is that he raised the question that the mind and the brain can act almost independently of each other, that they do not happen at the same time, that free will may just be uh, an illusion of a brain event. And I think this is the great importance of his work. Um, it raises more questions than it answers about free will. And I think the bottom line is that we are not in a position, we are baffled by the question, do we have free will or not? We do not yet know the answer to that question.